It's good to be uh, with you guys again today and just to get into uh, the book of Matthew. And um, we're going to be there today. Surprise, surprise. Matthew chapter 8. And turn there together. uh, Matthew chapter 8. It's going to steal somebody's. There's a lot of music. Oh, is that today's set? You took today's? Oh, this is other place. Oh. Damn. All right. That's okay. Maybe it wasn't meant to be. I just love the four song, though, that we sang today. Just the repentance part of, like, Jesus is everything that we need. In every circumstance, every situation. And I think it's a good spot for repentance because you and I have the habit of trying to fill our needs elsewhere and with other things and things of this world. Um, I was uh, I heard a joke yesterday about about that, just how silly that we are as human beings. And it was a comedian by the name of John Chris, and he was uh, telling telling a joke about this person who brought up. Uh, emotional support pet to church and was singing Jesus is everything I need but apparently not because you had your emotional support pet with you at church anyway it was just funny to me I just wanted to share that with you because we I was just thinking about that when we were singing the song I'm just like but it just shows our humanity right it just shows us sometimes that we can come in and we can you know it's one thing to sing the song it's another thing to really live it out And I think that what our songs do is they help us to do that. They're good reminders. And uh, what an appropriate song, I think, to sing every day to remind ourselves that Jesus is everything that we need. Therefore, uh, nothing that's going to happen to me today is going to be greater than him. And uh, so you guys need to wake up. (laughs) Wake up. Are you guys ready to get started? Yeah. Okay, all right, Matthew chapter 8. Again, we're going to continue to see Jesus perform miracles um, in, in, this, in this part of Matthew. This is what Matthew is introducing us to as Jesus uh, performing miracles. Matthew, uh, as he was led by the Holy Spirit, is presenting evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, And he has demonstrated power over human sickness and disease. We've seen that. Uh, uh, He's uh, presented himself. He's demonstrated power over nature. We saw that last week when he calmed the storm in the Sea of Galilee as they were crossing over. And now we're going to see and and going to read about his authority over the spiritual realm. Now we got a, a taste of that because... Previously, if you remember, after um, he healed Peter's mother-in-law, it said everyone came to the door and he healed many people who were sick and who were demon-possessed. So we, we've already kind of gotten a general idea that he can cast out demons and that he has authority over the spiritual realm. But today we're going to look at a specific story about him doing that here in Matthew chapter 8. And then, then it's, again, it is a must as we read through these accounts that you and I recognize the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's imperative. And I know I say this last week, and I'm going to continue to repeat it. It's imperative that people believe that Jesus is God. Because if you don't believe that, then you, you, you don't have a relationship with him. You won't spend eternity in heaven if you don't believe that Jesus is God. So it's imperative. It's a must. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20. Paul is reminding the church in in Colossae about that. He says, he is, speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, 
All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is who Jesus is. He is God who came in the flesh to sacrifice himself so that you and I can be reconciled to him because our sin separates us from him. And this is who he is. And so when we read about these miracles that Jesus performed, it should not surprise us at all because he's God in the flesh. Of course, he can do these things. Let's get to Matthew chapter 8. Now, last week, if you remember, Jesus calms a storm on the Sea of Galilee, headed to the other side. And so this event happens right after they get to the other side. This is when this event takes place, uh, beginning in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 8. And it says, and when he came to the other side, to uh, the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him. Coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? And now, uh, verse 30, Now a herd of, of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. A little different reaction here about this miracle from Jesus than what we've seen before in the others where people would praise his name or they would recognize that he is the son of God. He is the Messiah. He is God of flesh. They would recognize that. They would, they would praise. They would lift his name high, right? Not in this case, but we will get there. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this story with some differing details. And so we're going to look at the other accounts as we move through this passage this morning just to let you know. If you want to make a note in your Bible like I have in mine, I have right here next to uh, Matthew 8, 28, I have Mark 5 and Luke chapter 8. And that's where you'll find this story in the other books. It just helps when you're studying the Word of God. Okay, So uh, verse 28 of Matthew 8, uh, this is what it says, and when he came to the other side, to the country of the uh, Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. You know, one of the uh, phrases in this Thing because I think once we get to the this verse, once we get to the demon possessed men, that's what our focus is about. We're like, okay, cool. What happens to demon possessed men? We want to know, and we miss the very first part of that verse. And I just want to spend some time. You may be like, Steve, what are you doing? I, I just want to spend some time here because I, I there's just so many little things in Scripture that carry so much meaning. And here we have this phrase at the beginning of verse 28 that says this, and when he came to the other side. And this is one of those scriptures, it's a little detail, but it's one of those scriptures that speaks volumes. In this little phrase, you and I are assured that when Jesus says he's going to do something, he will. Don't you think that's important for us to remember that when Jesus said he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And he told the disciples, hey, we're going to, when he saw the crowd coming, hey, we're going to get in a boat. This is Matthew 8, 18. 
Now, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. He said, hey, disciples, we're going to go over to the other side. And the disciples believed him, right? Because they went and got a boat ready. And he got in the boat with his disciples. And they began to cross. And then something tried to prevent Jesus from going to the other side of the, of the Sea of Galilee, which was the storm, which we saw last week that he calmed, right? So nothing could stop Jesus from accomplishing what he came to do. And if he says he's going to do something, he will do it. Can I just give you a few of those things so that you and I can remember uh, this week or then, and then in the future when things arise that, hey, we have these things that Jesus said he was going to do and he's going to do them. John 6.37 says this, and that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Isn't that awesome? Anybody who comes to Jesus by the drawing of the Father, he will never cast out. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Some of you this morning need rest. Here's a promise from Jesus himself. He will do it. He said he will, and he will. In uh, John chapter 14, verse 3, he says these words, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Isn't that awesome? Jesus said he is coming back. And if Jesus does what he says, what's going to happen? He is going to come back. And he's going to take us to be with him. And we will be with him. And then the other final promise I want to tell you this morning, even though there's many more. Matthew 28, verse 20, and just be. Jesus says, and behold, I am with you always. To the end of the age. So he's with you now. He said he would be. He is. Now how many of you this week. You don't, I don't, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm just asking questions. I'm just talking about just this week. That some of these promises that Jesus, we've laid out this morning from Jesus. Would have helped you in some way or some form or fashion this week. Absolutely, it would. It would. This is how important that God's word is to us and his scripture and these things. It's all about Jesus and what he says he will do and he will do it. Now, that here they are in the land on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee in the country of the Gadarenes. Okay, that's what the verse tells us. And what do we know about the gatherings? Well, there's not like a whole lot of details. We know um, that they were from a region controlled by the town of Gadara. So therefore they're Gadarenes because they're from Gadara. So that was the area. They uh, were in one of the ten cities of the Decapolis, which again, Decapolis just means ten so they were uh, in the, one of those cities, and this was, or um, this area was known to be inhabited by Gentiles, and uh, we will see that a little later on because uh, because we read we read already in the verse that they had pigs there, herds of pigs, and so that would uh, indicate that that they were Gentiles and not Jews because Jews would not have done that. Because to Jews, pigs were unclean animals. And so that's the information that we can gather about this group of people that Jesus is going to encounter uh, in these verses. Also here in this place, we read that there were two demon-possessed men. And Matthew says that they came out from the tombs. So that's where they, they lived. They lived among the dead. And uh, he also states that they were so fierce that no one could pass by that way. Now, Mark and Luke give us a little bit more details about them, or at least one of the men. 
And uh, so we're going to read that from uh, Mark chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Mark says this, speaking of one of the demon-possessed men, it says, He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Can you uh, just imagine the fierceness of his possession uh, by these demons and what kind of life uh, this man was living among the tombs? In Luke uh, chapter 8, verses 27, it says, When Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. Luke gives us that detail. It's demons, plural. Uh, For a long time, he had worn no clothes. So not only was he fierce and strong and cutting himself and having all these issues that nobody could, there was no chain to hold him. Nobody had the strength to subdue him. Nobody could control him. This person, so again, letting you know the power, power that's behind the possession of demons. Um, And it says he wore no clothes and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. Again, another the same detail that we've gotten from all three. Luke also continues in verse uh, 29, the second half of verse 29. It says he says this about it for many a time. It had seized him speaking of the demon. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven uh, by the demon into the desert. So again, we get more details about the, this, particularly one individual of the two men um, that were possessed that Jesus is encountering. In verse 29, this is the response that the demons have when they see Jesus. This is, to me, this is so awesome. It says, and behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Before the time. Do you guys know what time the demons are talking about? (laughs) Not Jesus yet. What? The, the final judgment, right? The final judgment. Have you come to torment us before the final thing? Before you throw us into the abyss? One of the other uh, authors will record. You see, the demons knew exactly who Jesus is and what he can do. And that they, even in their rebellion, are under his authority. And I think that's something that everybody needs to know. <laughs> We have a world living in rebellion, but guess what? You're still under Jesus' authority. authority. Whether you've actually placed yourself under it or not, you are under the authority of Jesus Christ. He's made a way for you to place yourself there and to accept that, accept that authority over your life. But those who haven't, they think that they are, oh, I'm not under authority of Jesus. He doesn't tell me what to do, which may be true to them, but they're lying to themselves because Jesus has authority over everything. We just read it in Colossians chapter 1. All things were created by him, for him. And the demons know exactly who he is and that. That even in their rebellion, they are under his authority. James chapter 2 verse 19, it brings this verse to life for us. James says, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. We're here, we're seeing that right now. They're coming face to face with God in the flesh and they're afraid. They know who he is. Again, Mark gives us some more details. Mark chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, it says, And when, uh, speaking again of uh, one of the demon-possessed men, it says, And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he says, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? 
I adjure you by God, do not torment me. He knew the demon knows what his fate is. <coughs> Just like Satan knows what his fate is. And so they are working hard trying to, to bring us to the same fate, right? Instead of us being with Christ. But again, they understand who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh. Again, Luke 8, 28, Luke's account says this. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. You and I know from several places in the book of Revelation that a place of torment for demons is known as the abyss. And in Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, John writes this. He says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended after that he must be released for a little while so we know that this place called the abyss this is a place that torments Satan and his demons. Also, you and I know from the book of Revelation that there will be a final judgment. Again, Revelation 20, same chapter, verses 13 and 15. John writes, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. One of the arguments that many non-believers would have against having a relationship with God or worshiping God or coming to that place in their life is this why would a loving God send people to hell? And that's just a lie within itself. In a lot of instances, yes, Jesus does actually do that. He does send them to hell, but at their request. <laughs> people may not know that that's what they're asking to go to, but they are. If they don't choose... God through Jesus Christ they're asking to go to hell I mean that it, essentially that is the truth of what's going on it's disguised in many different <laughs> lies in many different ways but that's essentially what they are saying because to them to most of them it doesn't really matter because they don't believe hell exists anyway But there will be a final place in those not found written in the book of life. We'll be thrown there too. So again, the abyss, this place, this lake of fire as well, were not created for humans. They were created for Satan and the demons. It's just some humans say, I want to go with them. And so that's why they are taken to the same place. Let's continue with Matthew chapter 8, 30, 30, verses 30 through 31. Matthew records, he says, Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away to the herd of pigs. And um, we get more details also from Mark and Luke here. Mark chapter 5, verses 8 through 10 says, For he was saying to him, Come out of the man. He was talking to the demon, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, 
for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him them out of the country. And then Luke says, 8, chapter 8, verses 30, 30, 30 through 31, Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. So to the demons here, a herd of pigs was better than the abyss. But I, I think some people would have the notion or the thought when they read this, why wouldn't Jesus just take them to the abyss? Why would he let them continue uh, to be on earth? And I wasn't prepared uh, in my message notes to talk about this, but our adult Sunday school class led to this conversation, so I just kind of want to share something with you that um, could be another reason, and it's probably not going to make us feel very comfortable. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 16, not chapter 16. I will get there. Let's see. This is what happens when I'm not prepared. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Not chapter... It was an even number. I was close. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. This is what Paul says. And I want you to um, listen to what Paul says. Paul says this. So to keep me from becoming conceited because... Of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of God, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. This verse does a couple of things for us right now. First of all, it again confirms Jesus is authority, God's authority over demons. They can't do anything without his permission. We, we learned that from our study or your studies from the book of Job. Those of you who studied the book of Job understand that, that Satan and the demons can't do anything apart from God allowing them. And, and I know that that is uncomfortable. <laughs> I know it's uncomfortable because why would... God used something evil. Why would he do that? And so uh, that's my thing about why Jesus didn't destroy these demons is that they were still going to be used to carry out God's plans and purposes. Just because they do evil things. You know, we have a verse that you and I like to cling to in Romans, right? For all things work for the good of those who love the Lord. I guess that verse applies to that sort of situation too because he uses all things, good and evil, to bring about good for those who love him. I, I bring this up because, you know, I don't think that we think that way. We, we are so much um, bombarded with, you know, Lies about God or to think of God in a certain light or a certain way. And, and I often try to tell you guys this truth that applies here is that, you know, unfortunately, and I know this is not very sensitive. But God cares more, again, about the person that you become versus your circumstances that you're in. And you and I, as humans, we're so focused on our circumstances, we're, we're missing the work that those circumstances are doing in our lives to make us more like Jesus Christ. So again, these things should lead us to that deeper conversation with God about the things that are happening. And also just to lead us to surrender to him that whatever he has to us, has for us, even though it may be painful, that is for our good. 
That doesn't mean don't ask him to take it away. Because not everything, not every circumstance, not every bad thing, not every pain is for that reason. So we need to ask him and we need to pray and we need to trust God with his answer, whatever it may be. Paul got to that point too. He says, I prayed to God three times to take this away. But what was God's response to Paul? My grace is sufficient for you. It's the song that we sang. <laughs> Jesus, you're everything. Not an easy life. You're everything. Not having, not being sick. You're everything. It just brings that just a little bit more truthful to us. Now, again, the demons thought that the herd of pigs was better than the abyss. And so Jesus allowed it, verse 32, and he said to them, go. <laughs> so he gave them permission, go. And so they came out and went into the pigs, Matthew 8, 32 says, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. And I know we have some animal lovers out there that may not like this verse, but just to remind you, humans are more important than animals, okay? Just letting you know. Mark chapter 5 verse 13 tells it this way. It says, so he, being Jesus, gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd numbering about 2,000. Matthew was like, it's many. Mark says there were about 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of pigs. And they rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the sea. The demons had to do what Jesus told them to. They had to. And we, this is a reminder to us, we must be careful to understand this. It's Jesus that has the power and the authority, not us. Yeah, a lot of people walking proud thinking they got power and authority. But they're missing the key component of that, which is Jesus. You don't have anything. In fact, Jesus says, apart from me, you are nothing. You're nothing apart from me. So Jesus has the power and authority to do this. And it's when Jesus' name is on the line is what matters. And right here, his name was on the line with these demon-possessed men. And uh, I will tell you that it's not just saying the name of Jesus, but it's having him dwell in you that matters. And I, there's a passage of scripture that helps us with that in Acts chapter 19, 13 through 20. I love this. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 13, it says this, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So you guys understand what's going on? You got some Jewish leaders who were the supposed spiritual authority of the region. So they're going to handle spiritual matters. And so they go and they're going to they're gonna be exorcists. And they have found out that for some, some odd reason, using the name of Jesus works. And so they're going to do that even though they don't trust Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't have a relationship with him. Obviously, he's not indwelling them with the power of the Holy Spirit. None of those things. But they're just going to use the name of Jesus to try to do this. That's what's happening. And so we pick it up. And uh, so the Lord, they were going to, uh, again, invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who have the Spirit, saying, I adjure you by the, uh, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. It says seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirits answered them. I love this. Jesus I know. And uh, Paul I recognize. But who are you? Who are you? And the, the man in whom uh, was the, uh, the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them. 
them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. God used this, y'all read. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the, the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Do you know what the word extolled means? It means praised enthusiastically. Because Jesus has the authority. That's why you and I spent the this majority of this morning singing songs to him and about him because it is about him. He has the authority. He has the authority. This caused, this incident right here caused, I would call, I would somewhat call it a revival, even though it's in the early stages of the church, but it definitely caused people to repent. Because the verses go on to say in Acts chapter 19, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and uh, divulging their practices. So they become believers in Christ, but yet they were practicing other arts or other things that were in the, the world to try to do things. They were looking for other things, other outside of Jesus. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Mightily. All right, Matthew chapter 8, 33 through 34. It says this the herdsmen fled after witnessing what Jesus had done with these demon possessed men. They fled and going into the city, they told everything, especially what happened to the demon possessed man. Everybody knew about this guy. Everybody knew uh, what kind of condition he was in. Everybody was afraid of him. I'm sure he was an urban legend, all right, to the, to the community, as you and I would understand it, except it's real. It's not fake like most urban legends are. It was real. He was, uh, everybody knew, and uh, verse 34, and behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. How many of you guys have ever studied this story before? Several of you. I would, I would uh, probably guess that uh, some of the people that you studied or read uh, that are interpreting this story or verses or you've heard it taught, some of the people have interpreted these verses to mean that people were upset with Jesus for destroying their livelihood. That Jesus had messed up their, their way to earn a living by all these 2,000 pigs going into the sea and drowning and being useless to them. And, um, and that's why they wanted him to leave. Uh, you, you destroyed our economy. We want you to get out of here. And I can see where they might, I can see where they might think that. And uh, after all, there is another story about that with, uh, that, that happened to Paul and Silas. And uh, you guys remember the story where they were singing? We, in fact, I think we, it was in one of the lyrics and one of the songs we've been saying today um, where they were singing and praising God in the prison and an earthquake came and it, it shook the prison so much that the doors flew open and they were free to go, right? But then they hung out because the guard was, guard was freaking out. He was going to kill himself, right? They're like, no, 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 we're still here. But anyway, y'all remember that story, right? Well, th this same scenario is why they were in prison to begin with. So I just want to look at that story with you real quick. Acts chapter 16, 16 through 19 says, As we were going in, uh, to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her, own earner, or her owner sorry, much gain by fortune telling. So this girl, this slave girl, was possessed by an evil spirit, but she was able to tell the future. Okay? Yes, that is 
real. She was able to tell the future, and, it, and by doing that, it gave her owners, made her owners wealthy. Made her owners wealthy. And she followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Another demon speaking the truth. And, she, uh, and this she kept doing for many days. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed. Here's James' favorite word. You ever met James? Paul, who had become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Now, was it because Paul used the name of Jesus Christ? No. It's because Paul had Jesus Christ dwelling in him. It was Jesus' power that was casting out the demon. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that, that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And the story continues, and then we get to verse 23 through 24. It says, and when they had inflicted many blows upon them, so basically they beat Paul and Silas with many blows, they threw them into prison ordering the jailer, jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. This was a big deal. You don't, you don't mess with people's income or their way of getting money. You become an enemy really quick, at least in worldly standards. So why do people think that the, guard, the Gadarenes asked Jesus to leave because they, again, they thought that he destroyed the way of, their way of living. Just like we see, that's just how people act. And so I can understand why in, in interpreters of this story would, would think that. And I won't say it's not an option, but I think Luke really gives us the best picture of why. They asked him to leave. In Luke chapter 8, 35 and 37, Luke says this about this part. He says, Then the, the people went out to see what ha had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had gone. And sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, when they saw the, the, the demon-possessed man sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were what? Afraid. They were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon possessed man had been healed. And then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The people sent Jesus away because they were afraid. It's those same people, as well as the demons, who will one day have to acknowledge him as, as Lord. Would have to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Philippians uh, chapter 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone. And you and I, being, again, Monday morning quarterbacks, would be like, man, wouldn't it have been nice if they realized that right now in this moment? And they would have seen the miracle of Jesus healing their land of these, of demon possession in their land, who was not only tormenting the people who were possessed, but was apparently tormenting everybody else because they were afraid. And he took that away from them. Something that was... Dangerous, something that had hurt them and could hurt them. 
And they didn't acknowledge him as Lord. They told him to leave our lives alone. Go away. Leave us alone. Daniel prophesied about Jesus' authority in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel records this, I saw in the, in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like the Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not pass be destroyed. So maybe you're asking this because Matthew doesn't tell us what happened to the demon-possessed men. What happened to them? We know how the, the town reacted. We know how the people of the area reacted. Well, how did the demon-possessed men react? Well, we see from Mark, he records this about one of them. He says that he was... Uh, Mark chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. As he, Jesus, was getting into the boat because Jesus was leaving because the people didn't want him there. So he gets in the boat. And the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. The demon possessed man, he wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to follow him. And uh, Jesus, he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone what? Marveled at Jesus. This is what it's about. And I'm just, I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm wondering this morning, how many of us do this same thing to Jesus as the gatherings did? When he wants to change something for our good, we tell him to leave. Because we are comfortable with the mess that we're in. We're comfortable with the stink. So, Jesus, just leave me alone. We're comfortable with the pain. We're comfortable with being separated from Jesus in some area of our life. We want him involved with our eternity. But we want him to leave our daily lives alone, at least in some aspect. We want him to leave our money alone. We want him to leave certain sins alone. And I'm asking you, as I ask myself, won't you just give him your whole self? Just give him your whole self. Everything. I know things will be different. Yes, things will change. Things will be uncertain. But you'll be in the hands of the one who controls all things. And there's not a better place to be. The physical nature itself and the spiritual realm all are controlled by him. This is odd, but I'm telling you to be like the demon-possessed man who went and told how much Jesus had done for him. And just have everyone marvel. Not at you. But at Jesus, at Jesus. So what is it this morning that is keeping you from fully surrendering to him? 
what are you still trying to control that you obviously have realized I have no control over this and you really don't have any control over anything but what is it that you haven't surrendered fully to him and haven't put in his hands some of that means for us to just do things the way he said to do them in some of those aspects just do the things that just obey my command just do the things the way that I said and you will you will be surrendered to me Some of the things, again, I think we just, we have too tight of a hold on. We rely on too much. And we don't do what the, the song says today. We don't rely on Jesus for everything. I think as Christians, we say we do a lot because it's the right thing to say. I'm trusting Jesus. I, you know, Again, great thing to say. But is it real? Is it really what you're doing? Let's just spend a few moments this morning just asking God to reveal those things to our hearts. The things that we haven't surrendered to Him. And just take this moment. Begin the process now. This is not going to be a, for most of us, it may be for a few, but for most of us it's not going to be a one-time conversation with God. But it's a beginning. It's a start on this process of doing that, of surrendering ourselves to Him. So right now, while we have just this moment set aside this week to do this very thing, let's just begin to have that conversation with God about things that we need to surrender to.